supporters fire forces. Now, this framework looks at more the microeconomic environment of the business, and we're thinking about what factors, what forces can impact on your business and effectively squeeze your margin of your organisation. So we're thinking about what things might put a lot of pressure upon your profitability. And we can potentially use Porter's Five Forces for two perspectives. If you are thinking about going into a new industry, is it something you should really consider? Because when you consider all of these factors, if any of them are particularly strong, you might find it very, very difficult for you to compete within that environment. But you can also do it as more of a position analysis, saying we are currently in this position, and if these factors are getting stronger and stronger and stronger, then it might be worthwhile you leaving the industry now before it gets much, much worse for you. So what we're going to do is go through and talk through each of the five factors and essentially what they mean, and then we're going to look at an example so we can try to understand how we can actually put this into practice. So, first of all, you have competitive rivalry. And it says this is the to the assess the extent of competition within the sector in which the company is operating. This is where we're looking at your competitors who are already in that industry and are competing directly with you or will be competing with you if you move into that industry. And I want to think about how aggressive are these people going to be to try to take your market share away from you. And don't automatically think that because there are competitors out there, it is going to be competitive. If you've got lots and lots of big businesses within your industry and you are a very small player with a little niche market, they might not be interested within you at all. They might just say, well, fine, they've got 2%. It's going to be really hard work for us to get those customers from them without spending lots of money. We could leave it. But the flip side is true, though, that you could be a very large player in the market and there's loads of new people coming in who are small, but they could all be trying to chip away at your market share. So you can't have a blanket rule here as to what makes it competitive or not. You've got to analyse that situation and say, do I think these people are aggressively going to try to take my business away from me? Secondly, we've got buyer's bargaining power. Now, Porter was quite specific using the term buyers here, not just customers, because we often think about internal customers and external customers, and sometimes there's a big difference between the person who is actually consuming the product and the person who is actually paying for it, especially if you are being paid to do something by work, such as going on a training course. You've got to be very careful who that customer is. So what we're going to look at here is the bargaining power of the people spending the money. How much power do they have to try to negotiate some sort of discount from you, to get more services from you, and therefore this would gradually erode your profitability. And you want to try and think about things such as how easy would it be for them to leave and use a different supplier instead of using you. And if they've already paid lots of money, they've paid in advance and they can't get any sort of refund, it's going to make it very difficult for them to go. If they've invested in specific technology where they integrate their systems with yours and for them to leave, they'd have to set that whole thing up again with a new supplier, then they're going to have very limited bargaining power. However, if there's nothing stopping them to go, if there's loads of other suppliers available for them, they're going to have lots more bargaining power. Although the flip side is, if you have loads and loads of customers, even if it is easy for a customer to leave, if it's going to have a very small impact on your business, then potentially you could let them go and their bargaining power again would be reduced. Suppliers bargaining power, um, looking really at your main suppliers, how easy would it be for them to refuse to supply to you, to put up the price? How dependent are you on these people? And it's very similar to the buyer's bargaining power, just looking at it from the different perspective. And you've just got to think about, do you have to get your product from these people? How easy would it be for you to go elsewhere? Again, are you committed with them? Have you invested any money in sort of infrastructure? And do they have lots of customers or are you their only customer? And again, just trying to think about how easy would it be for you to leave and how easy would it be for them to change the prices that they are charging you. Threat from potential new entrants. Now, do be careful with this. I'm not thinking about what these people will do when they come in, because once they're in the industry, they effectively fall under that competitive rivalry that we had at the start. 
I want to know, is there a threat that there will be new entrants? How likely is it that new entrants will try to come into this industry? And there's lots of things to consider here. First of all, if it is a very profitable industry, if there's people in this industry already making lots of money, it's going to be very attractive for people to try to come in. We also need to think about how easy is it to get into the industry? Are there large barriers to entry, such as limited resources available to compete? Is it going to be spending lots of money on infrastructure to get into that business? And the bigger these barriers to entry are, the more expensive it's going to be and therefore the less likely you are to have new entrants. Finally, these threat of substitutes. This says assess whether any substitute products exist. Now, in its simplest form, we can think about direct substitutes for the products that you are actually selling. So if you imagine Coca-Cola selling their soft drinks, you know, you'd imagine a direct substitute could be Pepsi. But strictly speaking, you might start thinking about those as being competitors as opposed to just substitute products. And we've already thought about the competitive rivalry side of this. I want to start thinking about is there a completely alternative product that somebody could choose to have instead? So instead of having Pepsi and Coke, maybe people say, I don't want to have soft drinks anymore. I want to start drinking fruit juices or I want to move into water and have a completely different product. But we can actually stretch this even further to this. And this is not necessarily even a like for like product. This could be what would somebody else rather spend their money on? And if you were looking at the car industry, you might say somebody might buy a Toyota and a substitute could be a Honda. But what if someone is thinking, I could have a Toyota or I could go on holiday? And although you might not think of these as being direct substitutes, you just start saying this is an alternative thing that somebody could spend their money on. And what this is really assessing is what is the attractiveness of the product that you are selling? And if people choose to have a holiday as opposed to buying your car, that's really taken into account and they don't value that car as much as they value having a holiday. And this is a really important thing for your business, that even though you might think your product is better than your competitor's product, what if the industry doesn't want your product at all? What if people don't want to have cars anymore and they want to use public transport, they want to use their money on items that they will enjoy as opposed to a car? And I know you can enjoy a car, but they do cost you money. They, you do have to buy fuel and insurance, and at the end of the day, you've got to sell it for less than you bought it for. Maybe just go, I don't want to spend my money on that. I, I, there are alternatives I could use instead. I'm going to spend my money on something else. So Porter says it's important to think about all five of these things to assess whether this is an industry you should be in. So let's introduce a small example so we can go straight through and see how this whole thing fits together. If you imagine the training industry, so a college like Phoenix trying to think about uh, providing courses to ACCA or uh, similar students, and you start thinking about the competitive rivalry. And, and you've got to remember, I can't give you a blanket set of rules that will always work here. You have to assess it industry by industry, specific situations that you've got. Now, if I was to start looking at the competitive rivalry, you start thinking about how many other competitors are there in the industry and how much are you trying to take market share away from each other. The certain things I would look at, first of all, I would be thinking about the number of competitors that you have in that particular industry. But I think I'd also consider the growth in the industry. Because if you're in an industry that is growing very, very rapidly, there's more and more customers, you don't have to be as aggressive with each other because there's plenty of customers to go around. But if you're in a market now that isn't growing or is even potentially contracting slightly, you can become much more aggressive trying to get business from other people because there's no new business to get as such. The bargaining power of your buyers. So we might be looking at the students. So how much power do these students actually have with regards to this? And often you'll look at something called switching costs. How much would it cost somebody to switch from you to somebody else? And when you were to look at training, 
unless you have paid in advance, once you have done one course with somebody, there's no actual commitment to stay with them. You could very easily go to somewhere else. Now, in the short term, these people probably are committed because they've paid for a particular course, but long term they're not. And again, that's an important thing to consider when you're doing Porter's Five Forces. The difference between, in the short term, a lot of things are actually fixed, but things are much more flexible in the long term. The bargaining power, again, if I think about a supplier, let's say you could think about um, the book suppliers, if you use books, again, think about the switching costs. Are you committed to these people? Have you linked your material to the books? Have your tutors used these books already and are very, very comfortable with it? And if you're going to switch to a different one, you'd have to have some sort of investment to make sure that you are happy with the new material or your alternatives could be, uh, could you write the material yourself? And all these things would have to be taken into account to see whether you think it's worthwhile or not. And the lower the switching cost for you, the more bargaining power you are going to have for these suppliers and say, I don't want to pay that price anymore. I want to be paying less because I could just as easily go somewhere else. Um, threat of new entrants. I'm probably going to look at something like the barriers to entry of setup costs. And if you did want to set up a college, you're going to have to get premises, you're going to have to write material, you're going to have to pay for tutors. And when you start a new college, as you can imagine, you probably wouldn't get loads of students straight away. Over time, you'd hope it would grow. But in the short term, it is going to drain your cash very, very quickly. And the cheaper that cost becomes to enter into the market, the, big, the bigger the threat. But if it's very, very expensive to get into this, it's less likely you're going to get new competitors. Uh, the threat of substitutes, and um, I think what I, something I'd be looking at here would be to measure potential earnings of our students. Because I, I could look at this and say, if my students expect to earn $100,000 as a result of becoming qualified, that becomes really, really attractive. But if that value that they would earn starts to go down over time, if you're going to become a qualified accountant and earn $10,000 a year, it's not so attractive anymore. And as a result of it, students might switch from wanting to do accountancy courses to wanting to do something else. You know, but the reverse is obviously true. If it looks like people are going to earn loads more money as a result of this, the threat of substitutes would therefore become much, much weaker. And what you have to do is look at this holistically, try to come up with a measure for each one to say, do you know what, once that figure goes past a certain point, we're going to have a problem here. So if your setup costs go from being a million dollars to set up down to half a million, down to 50,000, you've got the potential of getting more uh, new entrants and you might be a little bit more concerned about this. Um, but come up with one for each, look at the whole thing holistically and say, I'm in this industry, do I think it's time to get out or can I stay here? And similarly, if you're thinking about going into a new industry, there's no point going into it if you think there's going to be hundreds more people coming in at the same time who are going to erode that business. So think about whether you should stay in the industry you're in, whether you should go into a new industry or not, and think the whole thing on balance with all five factors. But don't just do it once. This has to be an ongoing process because things change. So, for example, with regards to the setup costs, if you want to set up a traditional large college, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But over time, with the onset of technology, it's becoming much, much easier to set up things like online courses. And as such, it's going to become cheaper and cheaper for people. So then you start getting more and more new entrants coming in. And in an industry like this, if I was thinking of going into it and I wasn't in there already, I'd be too worried about other people coming in. But if I was already there and I've got a good presence, I think I'd feel a little bit more relaxed about it because you can maintain your position from the other factors and not worry so much about that particular new entrance one.